What's up guys? Whether you're new to Linux or you're a seasoned veteran, you've probably noticed that Linux has a very different file structure than Windows, especially if you go above the home folder, because the home folder on Linux is pretty much the only part where the file system is the same. Within a standard home folder, you'll see that we have Folders like our desktop, which just contains all of our desktop icons and any files or folders that we save to our desktop. We have our downloads folder, which contains download, our documents folder, which contains documents, and so on and so forth. We also get the same structure for every user that is on the system. So if you have a shared machine with multiple user accounts, each account will have a home folder with these same folders inside of it. Now on Windows, we don't call this a home folder. We call it a users folder. But like I said, other than the name of this, the structure is the same. But similarities end once we CD into higher directories. Take our root directory, for example, which is what I am in now. On Windows, we don't really have a root directory. The closest thing to the root directory would be the C drive. But as I'm sure you've noticed, if you have multiple hard drives or you connect a flash drive to your computer, then you'll get a D drive or an E drive or a drive with some other letter name. And that letter instead represents the root of that particular drive. So you have a different root for each drive on a Windows system. Now on Linux, we don't have drive letters, or at least not in the same way that we do on Windows. We only have one root. But in our root folder, we have folders like MNT and Media. These are the folders where our other drives and external media like flash drives, external drives, and even NAS drives get mounted. Now, in the olden days of Linux, you had to mount all of your drives manually. But these days, most distros and file managers will do this for you automatically, and they'll put them inside of the media folder. But if we have some other drive that doesn't mount, or for whatever reason you want to mount it manually, you would do that inside of the MNT folder. So if I go inside of my media folder, you'll see that I have my name Kenny because different users can of course mount different hard drives. So if there's multiple users in the system, you'll see each of their usernames here. And if I go inside of Kenny, you see that I have my passport, which is my external USB drive. And then I have all of these numbers here, which actually represents a CD that is in my system that I forgot I had left inside of my CD drive. Then if I go inside of my passport, this is essentially the root of my passport. So this is everything that's inside of it. Once you click into it, I can confirm that for you with this here. So you see that everything here, if I can snap it correctly. So you see that everything here matches up with what's in here. But if I was on Windows, this would instead be a D drive or an E drive. And then you would access this by just going to the root. So you have multiple roots on Windows, but on Linux, there can only be one. Going back to our root folder, you'll notice that we don't have anything like program files or program files x86. On Linux, we instead have a bin folder, which is what contains most of our basic programs or binaries in this case that is on our system. So this is where programs like ls itself, uh, touch, mkdir, all of those command line tools will typically reside in here. We also have sbin, which stands for system binaries. And this folder follows the same idea as bin, 
but this folder only contains binaries that a system administrator would use. And as a result, you need to have root privileges to mess with anything in this folder or use any of the system binaries in it. Check out my video on file permissions to learn more about that. Next, we have the boot folder. And this is another one of those folders that you don't really want to mess with because it contains all of the files necessary for the system to boot. So this is really only used by your boot manager, uh, typically Grub or any other type of boot manager that you would install on Linux. Next is the dev folder. And this is where all of your devices live because Linux, which of course follows the Unix philosophy. And one part of that philosophy is the idea that everything is a file. And let me clear this screen because I don't like how everything is blinking like that. So if we look at a disk, for example, which is flashing, this SDA is one of the disks that is on my Linux system. Typically, SDA will be the name of your first hard drive, so whichever hard drive uh, Linux is installed to is probably going to be SDA if that's your primary system. And then even the partition, so partition 1 on SDA is, of course, SDA1, but we have a file for the actual hard drive and the partition inside of dev because of course Linux follows the Unix philosophy. So we'll clear this and then the next folder is Etsy. Etsy contains configuration files for system-wide programs. So a program like apt for example, which is the command line tool to install other software, will have a configuration file in here where you can do things like add or remove repositories from apt. So let's go back to our root folder. And the next one that we have is lib. Now, you may have more lib folders or you may have less lib folders, depending on which distro you're running. On Linux Mint, I have a lib and a lib64. Now, these folders basically just contain binaries for our applications. So if you have a bunch of 32-bit binaries, then you'll probably have a lib32. But like I said, I don't have one on this system. Next is our opt folder, and opt stands for optional. So typically what you'll have in here is drivers from vendors. So say if you buy a printer that comes with a CD to install drivers, or these days you'll probably just have a link in the user manual to the uh, manufacturer's website like HP or whatever, where you can download drivers. Uh, but anyway, if you have something that you have to install drivers for, uh, besides NVIDIA drivers, then you'll probably see that those drivers go in here. Um, some software packages will also install into the opt folder as well. But I don't have any in my system, as you can see. The next folder is PROC. And PROC is where you're gonna find a bunch of pseudo files that contain information about processes running on your system. So you'll see that each of these folders, they have uh, just different numbers. And what these numbers actually stand for is process IDs. So if you use a task manager like HTOP, then you'll see that the process ID which is all the way over to the left on mine, uh, you'll see that this process ID number is the same as this folder name. So if we look for something like, um, see, I don't really wanna mess with OBS. Let's try Firefox. So Firefox has the process ID 11258. So let's CD into 11258. Um, new file or directory. Okay, so that's that's the wrong one. 
Uh, let's try let's try VirtualBox. I don't think VirtualBox is split up into multiple processes. So we'll CD two six one three eight. And so inside of here is basically all of the information about the VirtualBox process that is running on my system. Now, if you're a regular user, again, I don't recommend messing with any of these folders that are in here. So the next folder that we have is root. And root is the folder for the root user on your system. Now, if you have a fully set up root user, like you would see on Kali Linux, inside of here, you'll have downloads, documents, and desktop, etc. But on other Linux systems, the root folder just exists separate from the users folder so that if something goes wrong with your users folder, or in some cases, people actually have their user folder mounted onto a different partition. And so if something goes wrong with that partition, obviously you're not going to be able to log in. But since roots folder is inside of its own little folder, uh, nothing can really go wrong with your root folder unless something goes wrong with the root partition. But if something goes wrong with the root partition, then you're pretty much going to lose your entire Linux system. So it mostly remains there so that you can use root in case something goes wrong with your home folder for your non root user. Okay, and what's the next one on my list? Oh, yeah, run. So run is a very different folder than everything else that we've covered so far. So everything inside of this run folder is, well, the folder itself runs a tempfs file system. So everything in here is loaded into RAM and everything gets deleted from here whenever the system is restarted. Typically, you'll only have files in here that the system needs to start up. The next folder is the SRV folder, and chances are this folder is going to be empty on your system, just like it is on mine. This is actually a server folder, so the only time that you're going to have anything in here is if you're using your Linux box as a server, and you have a service running on it. So let's say you were using your Linux box as an FTP server. You would have an FTP service running on here. And then any users who wanted to connect to your FTP server would be able to get those files and folders from here. So anything that you actually wanted to share on that FTP server, you would put inside of here. And this is a very good design for running a service since the files will be in the root of the drive, which makes them a little bit more secure. And since this is at the root of the drive, it's also very easy to mount this folder if it happens to be on an external drive. The next folder we're going to talk about is sys. And this system folder gives us a way to interact with the kernel. Now, again, Messing with your kernel isn't something that a normal user would do. Even on Gentoo, where we have to build our kernel from scratch, we don't access it from here to edit the options because this is also a temporary folder like run. And then speaking of temporary folders, we have TMP, which as the name implies is a temporary directory. Now, this folder will contain temp files that are needed by programs for their session. So one example is if you're working on a document that you haven't saved yet, a shadow copy of the file will be saved in here. So if that program crashes, you can recover that document from here. The next folder we're going to talk about is USR, which stands for user. And user contains applications that are used by the user. Now, don't confuse this system or don't confuse this folder rather with bin or the sbin directories. Remember that bin contains binaries that 
everyone on the system would use. But user contains applications that only the current user is going to use. So if you've ever installed an application and noticed that it has the option to install for all users, then this folder is what that application was referring to. And if you check the box to install for all users, then it would install in each individual user's USR directory. And then finally, the last folder that we're going to talk about is var. And var is the variable directory, which contains files and directories, which will grow in size as you're running your system. Uh, so this contains things like crash data. Obviously, every time a program crashes on your system, which hopefully isn't very frequently, um, it gets appended. The information about that crash gets appended to a log file in here. So that is what your var folder is for. All right, guys. So thank you for making it to the end of this video. I know it's a little bit longer than the videos I typically make, but this is the Linux file system explained. If you have any other questions that I didn't cover in this video, be free to leave those in the comments section below and I will explain the answer for you. Hope you enjoyed this video. Share it with a friend that'll find it useful. Peace out, guys.